Welcome to the general chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, I'm going to be going through question 66 to, six to 70. So first, I'll show you guys a question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 66, 67, 68, 69, and 70. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 66, it says a reaction is determined to be spontaneous with a delta G naught of negative 412 kilojoules per mole. Which of the following can be concluded from this reaction? So we know that a reaction is spontaneous. Here's the delta G naught value. It doesn't even really have to be given to us. We just need to know that it's spontaneous, then we know delta G naught is negative. And then what can we conclude? So option A is saying the reaction is exothermic. This is not something that we can just automatically conclude because this is the equation for delta G. And for delta G to be negative, you could have you know, a negative delta H or you could have a positive enough delta S, so high enough entropy. So it doesn't necessarily have to be something which is exothermic, so that's not something we can conclude. Option B is saying the reaction pre proceeds rapidly at standard temperature and pressure. That's incorrect. This part here, the rapidly, make sure you don't confuse spontaneous with rate. Spontaneous is just telling us that if we you know, leave this reaction under STP, then it's gonna go from reactant to products, and it can do this on its own without us having to you know, manipulate it by giving it more temperature or giving it a catalyst or anything like that. It'll just go on its own. But it doesn't tell us anything about the rate. It could take a very long time to go from reactants to products. So rate has to be measured separately. You can't just conclude it like that. Option C is saying the reaction releases free energy to the environment. This is correct. So if we had some type of diagram and we have delta G being our free energy, and then we have reactants to products, products, because we are going down this much, this delta G difference is how much energy is released. So on the y-axis, we have free energy, and there's a difference in free energy between the reactants and products. The products are at a lower free energy, and therefore free energy is released to the environment. That's what it means for something to have a negative delta G and for it to be spontaneous. That means it's releasing free energy. Otherwise, if delta G was positive or non-spontaneous, then it would be you know, going up in free energy and taking in free energy instead of releasing it. Now finally, option D is saying the reaction experiences an increase in entropy. Just like with option A, this is not something we can conclude. Sure, if there's an increase in entropy, this would make it more likely that it's a reaction which is spontaneous, but it depends on the specific reaction. Maybe it, it's like very endothermic and that counteracts the increase in entropy. So it depends on the specific reaction. It's not something we can just conclude like that. But option C is something that we can conclude. So it's a correct answer. In question 67, it says the ion NH4+, plus or ammonium, it can be described as a blank. So there are three definitions of acids. And for this question, I'll let you know later, but like there's one which is kind of iffy, so you can have multiple answers. Option A is saying a Bronsted-Lowry acid. So this is one where the acid releases protons. And that is something which does happen with ammonium. So this is what ammonium will look like if some base came along and took a proton, then we have NH3. And so yes, it can release protons. You put it in some environment where there's a base and then it can release protons, or you can have even like another NH3 molecule come and take a proton. Yes, it can release an H plus into solution, which is why it is a bronsted Lowry acid. Is it an arrhenius acid? Well, the definition for that is if you put something in water, it'll create hydronium ions, and that can also happen. If our base was more specifically a water molecule, then what we would get is H3O+. So once again, it loses that proton, and then if we have it under conditions where water is present, then that proton can be taken by a water molecule to form hydronium. So it is also an arrhenius acid. And then for Lewis acids, this is the one that's iffy. There are some 
that define ammonium as a Lewis acid and others that don't. The definition for Lewis acid is that it accepts electrons. So it's not so much talking about just the hydronium and the protons part, it's just something which can accept electrons. And we see this when we're talking about some transition metals, something that has a lone pair of electrons can donate it, and then we're not seeing transfer of protons in this case, or H+, we're just seeing electrons. But for this question, we'll say that it is also a Lewis acid, because if you had just an H3, and then it reacts with some acid, it takes its electrons and grabs that proton, and then that's how it can become this guy, NH4. And so if we're going backwards, and we have NH4, plus some base came along, it took the hydrogen, well now these electrons are coming back if the nitrogen goes and takes those electrons back, then we come back here to the NH3 with a lone pair now. So it didn't have electrons before, now it got some electrons afterwards. So it's kind of like a transfer of electrons reaction. So because of that, we can also say that ammonium is also something which falls under the Lewis acid definition. However, for this question, if you said no to option three, that would be fine too. So for this, I'll say D, I will also accept B, and the other two are incorrect. In question 68, it says a specific gas is dissolved in a volume, Y, of a solution to achieve a molarity of X at a pressure Z. Which of the following depicts the concentration of the gas under a pressure P? So we have a gas, and it's dissolved. Here's our volume, molarity initially, and then pressure Z. So at initial conditions, it's at volume Y, molarity X, so that's the concentration, and pressure Z. And then we change something, so we have a new pressure P, and we're asked for this new concentration. So if you have a gas and you're thinking about it being dissolved, this should hint and you know make you remind you that the equation you use is Henry's Law, which can be written like this. So, it's the concentration or solubility of a specific gas in whatever liquid we're talking about over the pressure, the partial pressure of this gas above the liquid, and then that's equal from one condition to another. So in this case, if we plug in the variables that were given, so our initial concentration was X, our initial pressure was Z, that is equal to S2, is what we're still trying to find, and then our new pressure was P. So if we just multiply both sides by P, so times P and times P, this cancels out. So we have XP over Z is equal to this new solubility or this new concentration, which is equal to option D. So remember to use Henry's Law. Another way where you can also calculate this, what I like to do whenever I have a gas equation, is try to use the ideal gas law and just substitute it in some way. So I can do PV is equal to NRT. R and T are going to be constant, but if we move volume to the other side like this, that N over V just becomes concentration. So now it's P is equal to concentration times RT. And then if we had that being our first conditions, and then our second condition looks like this, CRT, then the RTs cancel out. So this is what it looks like. And then if you just do some cross multiplication, you'll get this type of thing. C and P, and we're looking for that blue C, so it ends up looking like this. Divided, hold on, give me one second. This guy should be blue. Yeah, this is blue, and then this was blue. 
So this is blue, and then this is like this. So pretty much what I did here is I just used the ideal gas law to give you the same calculation in the end. So there are two ways to answer this question. They should both give you the answer D. In question 69, we're asked how many valence electrons do elements in group 13 typically have? So we're talking about valence electrons, we're talking about group 13. So if we just pull up our periodic table, group 13 would be, hold on, sorry, this one over here, so with boron, aluminum, and all of the other ones. So remember, a group is this column, so it's going down. And in this case, the answer is three. There are three valence electrons. So you can think about the octet rule. You see that boron has five. And initially, in the first valence shell, it'll take in two. So that means in the next valence shell, we have three remaining. So there are three in that second valence shell, three valence electrons. And if you know for carbon, it's four. That's definitely something you should know for chemistry. Then just going to the left of it is going to give you three. Going to the right is five, and then six, and so on. But for this question, the answer is three valence electrons. In question 70, it says a carboxylic acid is found to be mostly deprotonated at a pH of 3.3. Which of the following could be its pKa? So we have some acid, it's deprotonated at pH 3.3, and then which one could be its pKa, potentially? So for this, you need to know the definition of pKa. When the pH reaches whatever the pKa is for a specific acid, that means we have a one-to-one -one ratio of the protonated form and the deprotonated. If it's deprotonated now, that means that we are more so on the basic side. So for example, if something had a pK of 3.3, and then we move to, let's say, one removed, so like 4.3, now we have mostly, instead of like a 50-50 ratio, we have 100% or almost 100% of the deprotonated form, whereas if we went more to a lower pH, which is more acidic, such as around 2.3, we have pretty much all of the acidic form. However, in this case, the pKa is not 3.3. We're asked what the pKa is. If something's mainly deprotonated at 3.3, so once again, if it's deprotonated, that means that we are higher than the pKa, so the pKa has to be something lower. So all of these options in B, C, and D can't possibly be the pKa. A is the one that can, is the only one that makes sense for it to be the pKa if we had it being lower. If, if it was 2.8, then it makes sense that if we start to go higher from it, we see more and more of the deprotonated form versus the protonated form, and that can't happen at the other possible pKa's. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here as well as in the description below. And in that course, we have tutors that have scored in the 99th percentile on the MCAT. We can give you things like customized MCAT study schedule as well as lecture videos from students that are actually medical students right now and we have a lot more. So check out our course to see what else we offer. Here are some reviews for the course. And that's it for this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to subscribe here so that you can see the new videos that we post. And that's it. I'll see you guys in the next one.